So two announcements. Uh, one is uh, I have released a solution to homework one, which is uh, in this password protected area. And the password is uh, the course number followed by the term. Okay? The course number followed by the term. Okay, there you go, that's homework one solution. And it basically has two problems. The first one is the relation algebra. Uh, the second one is uh, uh, testing on the definition of keys, uh, different kind of keys that you may have in a schema. So, what I will do is, I think I will give you guys some time to uh, look at the solution. So rather than going over this today, I will do this on Tuesday's lecture so that you have some time to uh, look at the solution and check against what you have done. And then we will, I, I'm not going to go over uh, every single problem in the homework, rather I will choose some ones, <coughs> choose some of the problems that I feel you may find uh, difficult to, to deal with. Right? I will go over those on Tuesday's lecture. But if you haven't done so yet, in, in other words, if you haven't practiced on your own on uh, problem one, you should try to do that at least before Tuesday to get a sense of what these problems are and why uh, some of them might be difficult for you to, to solve. Okay? All right. So let me just do a quick pool here. Uh, how many of you have done your homework one? I mean, there's no penalty whatsoever involved, right? So don't worry if you don't raise your hand. So how many of you have done your homework? Okay, about <coughs> half, right, about half. Okay, so for those other uh, who didn't raise your hand just now, did you uh, ignore homework one completely or you have attempt to try to solve at least some of the problems? So how many of you have solved some of the problems? Okay, so the rest of you basically didn't look at homework one at all. Okay, all right. Uh, that's okay. I mean, the model is set up this way that you can pace yourself. But let me be clear, if you want to do well in the midterm and in final, it is definitely necessary to do your homeworks. By the way, both midterm and final will be open book, okay? Which means you can bring uh, solutions to the homeworks, and you can bring lecture slides, and you can bring your laptop as well so that you don't have to print them out. Uh, but if you do bring your laptop, you cannot use internet. Right? You can only look at the material from this course website. You cannot Google and things like that. You cannot ask a question on Stack Overflow. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Those will not be allowed. Okay, any other uh, questions? All right, so that's homework one. Uh, I also have just released homework two. Can you look at this problem? Uh, this homework. Uh, homework 2 has two problems. Both, both of them are on SQL queries. The first one has 16 SQL queries, and the second one has another 10 SQL queries. The first one is on this database. And the second one is on this database. Okay. I have given out the <coughs> credentials to log into this database on the Canvas website, right? You should have received a notification for the announcement over there. If you haven't, just log in to Canvas website, <coughs> click on announcement. The second announcement contains the credentials for you to log into this database. Okay? <coughs> the first one is a fake database. The second one is a real database. The first one is small, the second one is large. So make sure you do the first problem first. To practice and understand you, you know, make sure you know what you're doing before trying those ones on the second one. Because if you write a really <coughs> bad SQL for the second uh, database, you may take down the whole database itself. Right? Because this one has millions of records, uh, so it's big. Right? If you're not careful in what you're writing, you may end up uh, reading a lot of load on the server, right? which might take forever to run. Question on this? Okay. <coughs> All right. 
Now being said, let's continue on. Discussion on SQL, then move on to uh, uh, the discussion on Davis current. Okay. So last time we stopped right at uh, uh, the drone, right? Okay. On this slide. <coughs> so we can pretty much already do drone, right? By using the front clause and the word clause. Of some condition involved, right? That's pretty much a join, right? If you think about it. Right? This is a condition expressed using some attributes from R1, R2, respectively. Uh, this is equivalent to a join in relation algebra. Remember, in relation algebra, we talk about two types of join. <coughs> One is a natural join. The other is what we call theta norm, or condition norm. Right? With a condition. Right? We talk about uh, what this means right, in relation algebra. Uh, so both of this can obviously express using this particular syntax. <coughs> but because join is so important, uh, the system has introduced a particular keyword that, that's reserved for expressing a join syntax. Uh, that's what we're gonna look at next. So this is the expression for a join. Essentially, you have select from where clause as is, but then in the from clause, you're gonna have this particular keyword called join uh, that expresses a join condition over two tables. You have table name, uh, table name. You have two tables, and then you can use inner join. Uh, alter join. For alter join, you can do left, right, or full alter join. And then followed by a qualification list, which is the condition for the join itself. So again, this part is a regular expression. And in regular expression, we, we mentioned that okay, the vertical bar is the choice you have. So you can choose between left, right, or full. These are the three choices you have. You can also choose between inner or alter. Okay, there's another vertical bar, vertical bar between inner and outer, right? So you can choose among those two. So all, if you think about all the possible choices you have, you basically have inner join and outer join. And for outer join, you have left, right, and full outer join, right? So those are the possible choices you can, you can do uh, with this join semantics. <coughs> The default is the inner norm. So this is the default. If you don't specify anything, you simply say table one, join table two on complication list. Uh, that basically means you are doing an inner norm. So this is the default. That's the default. Okay. So let's look at some examples. Let's start with inner norm. So uh, inner join is pretty much like a, a theta join. This is pretty much the same as theta drum, where the theta is your qualification list. This is just two. Okay? That's the way you understand inner drum. Is that clear? Okay. Of course, there is also a natural drum uh, keyword in SPR. The meaning of this is exactly the same as what we have studied in the relation algebra. So that's fairly straightforward. So let's look at one example. Suppose these are my two input instances <coughs> of sailors and reserve, and I do an inner join over them. Uh, the condition is sail ID equal to sail ID. What do I get? I basically uh, find the cross product of the two that give me six records in total. Among those six records in the cross product, uh, this pair satisfies the drawn condition as well as this pair. Only those two pairs satisfy the drawn condition. 
that's what you get. Of course, you also need to do the projection in the end. I put out the seed ID, the name, and vote ID. From those two rows in the cross product. That clear? So that's the <coughs> inner join. Okay? What about outer join? So outer join is something that we do not have in relation algebra. So this is something specific to uh, SQL. So <coughs> the reason that you want to have outer join is sometimes, let's look at this example, right? What this example does is to print out the name of sailors and sailor ID as well as the boat that sailor has reserved for all my, based on all the records I have from sailor and the preserve. But one problem with this approach is that for those sailors who have never reserved a boat, they will not be in the output. There's no way you can capture that in the output. There are cases where I do want to show a list of all the sailors and the associate boats he or she had reserved when that happens. But if he or she hasn't reserved any boat, I still want to see uh, their names in the final output. But this happens quite often, right? You can imagine, you know, there are many applications that this may happen. Uh, so what do you do? Well, in that case, you rely on outer join. So using the same example, I simply change inner join to uh, left outer join. And that will do exactly what I have said just now. In other words, it will show all the sailors, <coughs> and then for, the, for those sailors who do have a reservation, I show the boat he or she has reserved. But for those ones, those sailors who haven't made any, any reservation, I still show their record in the final output. Okay? So using the same instances as the input, what will be the output in this case? <coughs> well, clearly we still have the two records from inner join, right? Those will satisfy my join condition, so they will be in the output. Uh, what about the additional sailor you have, the sailor ID 31? This guy hasn't have not reserved any boat yet. So in the inner join example, uh, this sailor will not show up in the final output. But since we're doing a left order join, this sailor <coughs> will end up in the final result. The only question remains is, because this record does not participate in the join, there is no matching boat ID for this record. What should I do when I try to project out a boat ID that this record doesn't even have a reservation for? Well, you, you put out a null value. So this will be a null value here, right here. Okay? So that's the semantic for auto join. And can you specify a default value instead of that value? Uh, typically no. Typically no. For auto join, typically no. Uh, but some of the system that I'm not aware of might allow you to do that. But by default, auto join leaves the attribute from the other side that you do not have a matching condition on as not. Okay? <laughs> so that's the left auto join. Similarly, you can do right auto join. For example, I want to print out <coughs> the sailors and the boats they have reserved, but for those boats that have no reservation made for them, I still want to show them in the final output. Not for the sailors, but for the boats. Then using the same example, you simply change that to a right auto join. What about if I want to show both the sailors and the boats that do not have a reservation record for each other? Well, I do a full auto join. Do a full. Okay, so let's look at the right auto join example. For the boats that do have a corresponding reservation record, I will print out the CID. But for the boats that do not have any reservation made on them, I will print out the boat ID and boat name, and the CID will be left as null values. That's the right auto join. Easily, you can say that you can do right auto join uh, with a left auto join by simply flipping the order of the two relations in your query expression. So I can do the same thing by from both left auto join sailors, and that will give you the same thing as at this output. Okay. So lastly, we look at the full auto join using the same example. <coughs> 
we get this. By the way, in this particular case, you notice that the result of the full outer joint is the same as the result of the right outer joint. That's not because they have the same query semantics. Rather, it is because this particular input. Okay? There's no sailor who has not made any reservation uh, on any boat. That's why the full outer joint is the same as the right outer joint, because there's no sailor that you can include in a full outer joint case. That's not covered by uh, the inner joint already. Kind of make sense to you? So you can think about full outer joint. As <laughs> as three parts. Obviously, I have inner joint results. Okay. We also have left outer joint. Of course, if you view that as a set minus inner joint, and as well as schemas, physical schemas. I'll give you an example. In this case, I want to look at the number of reservations on all red color boats. For each of the red color boats, I want to know the number of reservations for them. You know, how do you do that in SQL? Well, very simple. You forget about this preview mass. Start from here to here. That's how you show the number of reservations on each red color boat. You do a join between boat and reserve, you group by the boat ID, and in the where clause, make sure only the red color boat is involved in the join, and show the count. Make sense? You follow me? Without the preview as right. Don't look at this here. Start from here to here. That gives you the number of reservations you have on each red color boat. <coughs> but suppose you want to do this on a daily basis, every single day, I want to get an update on the number of reservations you have on my red color boat. So if you if you if you were to do this, what you have to do is type this SQL query every single day, right? Type this SQL query every single day. And so you realize some shortcut, right? What you can do is type this once, saving a text file. Tomorrow is just control C control V. Okay. Oh, come on, see, come on, if you're using Mac. Right? <laughs> but the problem with that is you still have to do this Control C, Control V, and what happens if you leave the company tomorrow and nobody knows where that magic text file is stored at? Uh, then everything messes up, right? So somebody else has to do this once again, right? So to make it convenient. What you can do is use a, something called view. You can create a view and give a name for the view on called rest. You can use any name uh, if you like. The number of uh, reservation you made on the rest, color, red color boat. And use the renaming operator as basically this name now is equivalent to this whole block right here. Okay? And next time, all you need to do is Complex. So let's erase the complex. 
And what the database engine will do is, is whenever the database engine see this keyword after you have defined, of course, it will simply replace this with its definition, which is this whole block right here. So <coughs> there's one obvious benefit of doing this, which is to make query writing uh, really convenient, especially for those uh, <coughs> blocks of SQL statements that will be used repeatedly. This become really convenient. Make sense? Okay. Of course, there's a lot of interesting uh, questions to be answered here. The first thing that you may realize is, after I have defined this this view, should I the keyword is materialize this view. What do I mean by materialize? <coughs> if you look at any other table in your database, they have a schema, they also have instance. In other words, the actual data associated with that table. View is different. View is not one of your schemas. In other words, if you look at what happened here, we only define its schema and what should go into that view. But we never really know for sure that whether the database actually have pulled data out from both and reserve and pulled them into your view. Okay. If you think about this as the box. This as a preserve. Now you have a view of that. Okay. The question is, <coughs> do I have an instance here? You can go either way. You can argue, yes, I should produce the instance at the moment you defined, meaning that I, you know, I use the, the red record from this, I join them. And that give me some record here, I should put them here. What's the benefit of doing that? The benefit is next time when you write a single statement against a view, you no longer need to do this execution in real time. Rather, the results are already available for you. You can <coughs> grab from this instance and you're done. Really efficient. <coughs> but what's the downside of this approach? No free lunch. What's the downside of this approach? <coughs> Do you have any update on the board or? <laughs> if you have any updates on the boat or reserve, you have to update this instance to make sure you have a consistent view that agree to the data you currently have, which can be uh, really expensive if you have a lot of updates going on. You follow me? And if you have taken an uh, undergrad data class, for example, if you have taken my undergrad data class, we talk about one subject called uh, normalization. Normalization, right? First normal form, second normal form, third normal form, BC, NF normal form. So, what is the normal form? Well, fundamentally, <coughs> it has to do with. Redundancy in the database. Redundancy in the database. <laughs> From the classic relational database point of view, redundancy is the evil of a database. Redundancy is the evil of your database. Why people say that? Why redundancy is bad? Because redundancy produces uh, dependencies. When you have dependencies in your data, it makes updates and, and changes to your database are extremely difficult because you have to make sure all dependencies actually hold after an update. If you are not careful in tracking all the dependencies among your data, uh, you may end up in trouble. For example, I'll give you a simple example. You have a student table. Okay? And in this table, you, you store two things. Let's say you store SID, you store many things. Let's say, but there are two attributes of particular interest. One is, uh, well, the year of birth, which year you were born. Okay? And you also store 
h by n. Makes sense, right? But soon you realize this is actually the very bad design. Why? Fundamentally because and this error reads as a determines. Year verse determines age. Okay? Determines age. Do you follow me? You use the current year minus at, at the time of inquiry, minus away the year of birth, you get the age of the student. In other words, this value depends on this value. There's no point for you to store this value at all. Not only it pr <coughs> produces storage overhead, you may argue this is cheap. I don't care. Storage overhead is nothing. But it, it gives you <laughs> trouble in terms of updating your database and so on so forth. Every single year, you have to massively update every single record in your database to make sure the age value uh, is up to date. Do you follow me? And there's no point of storing this value. And this is one example of redundancy and that create dependency on values in your database. That's a very simple example. And there's a formal thing to analyze all of this. It's called Functional dependency that leads to the, all the discussion on normal form, normalization. Right? So that's kind of like a quick review of what should have been covered in your undergraduate class, right? <coughs> but all of this, uh, why this has to do with view? Because essentially, view, if you think about not if you understand what I'm saying so far, a view is nothing else but manually creating some dependency in your labels. Which goes against the fundamental principle of normalization, which is to remove redundancy. But then why you still want to have view? Well, for the reason I have argued, one is to make your query writing more convenient, but more importantly, to make your database more modular, easier to understand. For uh, people who do not follow your database like every single day, right? Like I'm, you know, I'm a, another programmer. If you are the main one designing the database, and one day I want to look at your code and try to understand what you're doing, instead of reading this block over and over again at different places, I look at this only one place and know this is the rest. Then I only need to look for this keyword uh, at the many places. Make your code and system much easier to understand and to maintain. Right? So that's why view is still important. But then they bring up this challenge of when do you materialize your view? And there are many, many uh, topics and research work done with respect to this subject. Uh, I, I'm not going to go over the details, but uh, you name it, they cover all the possible choices. You materialize all of them at the beginning, you do on demand materialization, or you materialize half of your tables, or materialize for some of your tables where you analyze your workloads, those records depend on up, uh, records that barely receive any update at all. And for those frequently updated records, you do not materialize that. You rather you materialize on the fly. And you can, you can think about all these different combinations, right? So, so that's uh, what you... So the point is, when you actually go and use a database, you want to be uh, careful when you declare a view. Because under the hood, it could be expensive to maintain and use that view. So uh, use with you uh, use with discretionary. Right? Don't use view uh, whenever you just want to use it. Right? Think about all the efficiency issues uh, related to view. Here is an example of this using the <coughs> the instances we have. I mean, this I think the earlier instance. I'm not going to go all the way back, but if you look at the earlier example instance. Defining this view give you uh, an, inst an instance for the view like this. But in a lot of cases, they may not materialize this uh, at, the, at the time you define the view. Rather, they will materialize this on the fly when you need the data from the view. Okay? That's about it, I think. Uh, we do have another slide, another lecture slide on SQL. Let me show that just quickly. <coughs> 
but I'm not going to go over this. Uh, what what's covering this slide is oh, it's gone. So this this slide I'll ask you covers topics like uh, assertions and triggers. So uh, assertion and triggers uh, are the things you use to enforce the constraint we talked about earlier, right? Remember we talked about integrity constraints. And one of you actually I remember asked me about how do we actually enforce this uh, integrity constraint, either. Uh, being expressed as a column constraint or being expressed as a table constraint. And the way the database uh, system enforces them is by using either assertion or triggers. Uh, those topics I decided not to cover uh, in this class because our primary focus here is uh, in understanding the kernel database system. And assertion and trigger, uh, they are nice features of database but they are not really a core feature of any database engine, right? So we decided not to cover them. Uh, we did cover this in undergrad database class. So if you're interested, you can uh, look at the slides and try to understand them uh, themselves yourself. But uh, it's not uh, part of the requirement for this class for you to understand. Okay. <laughs> um, in addition to that, there are some additional uh, minor details regarding SQL, like how do you sort the output? You use order by. Uh, with the keyword uh, descending or ascending. <coughs> uh, there's some discussion on view, and then there are also discussion on access control. Again, this is not required, but just briefly, very briefly, uh, this module allows a database administrator to specify which account can access which part of your database. For example, in homework two, using the account I give you guys, you can access these two databases, uh, DBLP and CS65DB, but you only have what we call the select privilege on those two databases. Meaning that, in other words, read only, right? You only have read only access to those databases. And how I managed to do that is to use uh, 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 this particular module in a database system. If you're interested, you can read this. But again, this is not the part. <laughs> okay, that's, that's all. I think I cut off those slides on, on this. I will, if you're interested, send me an email. I will uh, send you a copy of slide on those topics. And trigger and assertion, and you can read that one. Okay, now said, let's move on to uh, the kernels. Where you store 
for your data. Where is story data? And that leads to the first discussion in understanding kernel, which is the storage media of your data. The storage media of your database. Now, what device you use to store your database? And there are many, many choices, of course. Uh, you have tapes, you have hard drive, you have solid state drives, SSD, you flash drive. You also have memory, you also have cache. And there are some new players on the horizon as well, for example, the non volatile RAM. And things like that. So, the first topic we're going to do is to uh, talk about uh, these different choices of storage media and look at their properties and what <coughs> potential impact they have uh, to uh, the design of your database system. So now, <coughs> the other thing we need to understand is, what is a system? We, we said this many, many times. Okay, we are talking about, we are going to understand the kernel of a database system. So now we understand database, but there's another word called system. Uh, what is a system? There are some misconceptions about system, right? People argue system is uh, a lot of code. We say system, that's a lot of code. We say algorithm, that's Small, level, small amount of code. Uh, that's algorithm. You have a lot number of code, lot, many many lines of code. Uh, then that system. So, right? Uh, I will say locks. You say okay, when it's more than five thousand hour uh, line of code, then become a system. Uh, that's wrong. Okay, that's wrong. Okay, that's really wrong. Uh, because uh, system. <coughs> doesn't have to have a lot of code, right? Of course, typically a system will have a lot of code, but it doesn't mean that that's, that itself is the sufficient condition, all necessary condition. So, what is the system? Uh, I think this is a reasonable, uh, uh, well-defined uh, statement regarding what is the system, right? Uh, what's interesting about this is, it, I, in my personal opinion, this does not hold, does not only hold for computer system. It holds for system in general, right? If you talk about human society, what is the system? A democratic system, a dictatorship system, a capitalism, socialism, it's all about this, efficient and safe use of limited resources. Right? Why? Because if you have unlimited resources, uh, you don't really care about system. Right? If I tell you guys, each of you can have whatever you want. No matter how long and where you are, you can get what you want immediately. It doesn't really matter where you are, you know, what kind of system you use. I don't care. Seriously, right? If you think about it. Computer system is the same. It's because we have limited resources. For example, we have limited amount of disk space. We only have so many CPUs. We only have so many RAMs. That's why we care about how you write your code to make the best use of those resources. Right? Otherwise, you don't really care, right? If you have exponential number of CPUs, even an exponential algorithm is okay. Because if you have exponential number of CPUs, uh, and an uh, exponential algorithm, you run them in parallel, you still get uh, linear time in the end, if you can scale up linearly, suppose. Right? So, if you have limited resources, that drives the needs of efficient and safe use of, of these resources. And that's essentially the definition of system. And in order to achieve this goal, it could be you have a lot of <coughs> lines of code, or it could be that you have a small amount of code, but still does exactly this, then that's also called a system, right? So a database system has <laughs> many layers of modules that go into it. Those are the top layers, what I call application layers. And we cover uh, the relation model and SQL. What we didn't cover is functional dependency, normalization, and things like that. But I also give you a very quick review on those topics too. 
<coughs> Next, we really gonna go into this part, which is what is inside a database kernel when you type that SQL statement, what happens behind the scene that really uh, get the results that you want. And this involves physical design, indexing, query evaluation, and query optimization, and many, many other interesting topics that we will go over uh, starting from today. Okay? And I argue the first thing you need to understand is storage media. So this is a very generic oversimplification of the storage media that go into a typical computer uh, today. Right? You will have a CPU on top. Then you have cache attached to that CPU. And you have different layers or levels of cache. I want out to uh, at each level, you have instruction cache and data cache. So what is a cache? Cache is a register that attached to your CPU and really, really fast. And store small amount of data, but enable extremely fast processing over those, those data. <laughs> so that's cache, right? And also at cache, what do you have? You have memory, right? You, you, you learn memory, uh, which is typically known as RAM. Let me throw a question out. So what is the RAM? Can someone tell me what does RAM stand for? This is the acronym, right? What's the full word for the RAM? Yes? Magnetic system. Okay. But why? Why is it called random access memory? You know? It's as opposed to like sequential access or you can access like any any part of the memory. Because Charlie said <coughs> it's named as random access memory because we want to differentiate this with sequential access memory. Okay? Whereas sequential access memory means that you can only access the location sequentially. Think about this classroom as a RAM, uh, not as RAM, as a memory, either random access or sequential access. A sequential access would mean if I want to access this location, I have to do like this. I have to go all the way back, come back, go several trips until I reach some point. I have to go through each location sequentially. But I think that distinction is not the fundamental point yet. Why? Because I can argue, if you give me a sequential access memory, I can always build a random access memory on top. I can wrap a layer on top Accessing this location is just going this way. Accessing that location is like going this way. I can abstract away all these details from you, and from you, from you, I can still do a random access. <laughs> do all of you follow me? So what's the fundamental difference between the two? Uh, because the RAM stores the programs that are currently running. So only what is immediately uh, needed in the memory is uh, kept in the RAM. Stuff that is needed for fast access. Well, what you are saying is the you are going back to the hierarchy of storage, right? You are saying what's needed will be brought into the memory. But that I mean I can do the same thing with sequential access memory, right? I only bring data needed into sequential access memory. You can access any memory location with linear time. Um, well, I mean like Linear time is this. Oh, sorry, linear oh, time is sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, constant time. Yes, constant time. You can access any location in linear time if you're using a sequential access time. Linear to what? Linear to the size of your memory, of course. In the worst case, I traverse the whole memory space, I can access any point you want. And like I said, I can even write a wrapper around that to give you the misconception that you, you are using a random access memory. But if you were to do that, you realize that if I draw a figure, this is time, this is the location. What would the figure look like if you use this approach? You input the RAM using a sequential access memory. It's kind of like that, right? 
Well, if you're using a, a truly RAM, what do you get? You get this. Okay? That's why it is called random access memory. The reason is, no matter how big your memory is, accessing any one location, of course, we also have to be careful in what do you mean by a location, right? Reading one byte, obviously, is not going to be the same as reading 10 terabytes. A unit location, where a unit is a view definition, typically a unit is a few bytes or a few kilobytes, depending on whether you're talking about page or whatever. We will, we will talk about this, but a unit location of the same size take about the same time. So that's right, okay? That's why people call this random access memory. Okay, random access memory. Eric, what's your name, by the way? Eric. Eric. <coughs> I didn't click something bad. Anyway, <coughs> so that's RAM, that's RAM, that's memory. Now, now outside RAM, what do you have? You have disk. Right? You have disk. And this also support random access. This also support random access. However, a major distinction between this and memory is that random access time on a disk is no longer uniform. Random access time for a RAM is uniform. Random access time for a disk is no longer uniform. Why is that? We will explain that in a minute. But this is pretty much uh, a typical hierarchy for any storage in a computer nowadays, right? Cache, memory, disk. What could go in between is some of the new players, such as Solid State Black, such as non volatile RAM. We will talk about these conventional players first before we touch these new guys uh, later on, right? So let's focus on cache memory and disk, then we will come back and visit this relative new player in this club. Right? In this club. So cache, as I argued, is the fastest and mostly, most costly form of storage. By, by costly, what I mean is a dollar per byte. Dollar per byte. Dollars per byte carry two meanings, right? One is, from the customer point of view, how much you have to pay dollar per bus. And the other meaning is, from the manufacturer of the storage media point of view, if you are, a, if you are in the business of making <coughs> cash on memory and disk, uh, what is the cost for you to produce uh, this media, this particular type of storage media? Right? So, cash is most expensive in terms of dollar per bus but it is fastest. And also there are physical constraints uh, that limit how big the cache can be. Because cache is supposed to go with the CPU. And the CPU, the opponent, the Moore's law, the fundamental thing about Moore's law is that for the same amount of surface, how many registers or tran transistors you can put into that surface so that it can double or triple the speed every so many years. That's the basic way of understanding more. Right? But the same thing goes for the cache, because you have the same uh, area limitation. Okay? Your cache cannot be uh, superficially big, even if you don't care about dollar per byte. You follow me? Okay? There are physical constraints that go with this. And another <laughs> important feature of cache is, is volatile. Volatile in computer uh, sense, what that means is, once you lose power, or your system fails, uh, whatever data in the register is gone. There's no way you can recover that unless you have some backup mechanism in place. Right? If you don't, then you lose your data forever. That's what we mean by volatile, when power is gone. Power is gone. So that's cache. What about main memory? Main memory access speed is typically in the order of nanoseconds. Nanosecond is in the order of 10 to the power of minus 9. Okay? 10 to the power of minus 9. What about disk? <coughs> disk is typically 
uh, in the order of milliseconds, which is to the power minus six. So there's a huge difference in terms of speed of <coughs> if you compare memory versus disk. Okay, memory versus disk. But memory, <coughs> technically, your memory will be too small to store the entire database. I'm talking about really large databases, right? Like those ones that a large corporation would have to deal with, like Google and Facebook. And their database is in the order of terabytes. And you memory, I mean, the memory has, of course, the capacity of memory has gone up dramatically. You know, when I was a high school student, my first interest in computer uh, was inspired by games, right? I mean, I guess most of you uh, follow the same path. I was uh, really keen to play this particular game uh, that requires 16 kilobytes of memory, 16K of, of RAM. But the particular uh, computer I have, it's a 486, Intel 486. Initially, I have 386. Then I upgrade to 486. But my, at, at one point, I only have 8 kilobytes of RAM. So I'm short of 8 kilobytes uh, to in order to play that game. So we actually, that, that's my first inspiration, inspiration in, in, in computer. Uh, one of my friends uh, worked with us to kind of write a, a small program that mimic uh, uh, memory using disk. In, in today's world, that's kind of like a swap, right? Swap space. Also in some sense, something similar to that. That enables us to, our, our, the, the right terminology is virtual memory, right? That enables us to play that game, right? But nowadays, if you look at computer today, you have easily you have gigabytes of uh, memory on a computer. But even gigabytes is not enough to store all your data, to store all your data, if you have terabytes of data, right? So that's, that's the problem with, the, with memory. Another challenge with memory is, similar to cache, is volatile. Meaning that if you lose power, your data is gone. Unless you have a backup someplace, uh, you lose power, your data is gone. <coughs> and, but CPU operates only data from memory. Actually, this is not precise, because CPU only operates data in cache. But when you make this abstraction in a database system, as we talk about here, uh, we focus on uh, the fact that CPU operates data from code or code memory. In reality, CPU only operates on data that's in cache. That's in cache. Okay. So lastly, we look at disk. <laughs> it's Disk is still the primary medium for long-term storage of your data. Of course, we have tapes as well. Uh, that support only sequential access to your data. Only sequential access to your data. But that's really for archive purpose, right? You, you store your uh, historical data on a tape uh, that you can store somewhere and only read it when absolutely needed, right? Because it's really slow. Uh, disk is still the primary medium for uh, long-term storage of data in any computer. Why is that? Because it's non-volatile. Disk is non-volatile. Meaning that once you lose power to your system, data will be still stored on disk. You can recover them safely without worrying about losing your data. And the reason for that is uh, memory and disk use fundamentally a different physics to, uh, to represent zero and ones. Represent zero and ones. Computer uh, in under this uh, Turing machine model is basically zero and ones. Right? zero and ones. If you can represent zero and one, you can represent any data you like. And in this, this is uh, the the data zero and one bits are represented using this magnetic field on the disk. And magnetic field is persistent even without power to it. Right? That's why this is not all the time. And you have some additional storage on the disk. Those are not really that important to uh, the discussion here. <coughs> if you draw them out on a graph, what you have is a hierarchical structure like this. You have cache on top, memory disk, and some optimal storage, like CD drive. Those are less and less common nowadays. Right? I rarely see 
like my laptop nowadays, do not carry an optical, op, optical um, drive. Why is that? Because for the size, right? you need to make this really small and I think to make it easier to carry around, uh, so you don't have this optical storage anymore. Tips, again, this is only needed for long term, really long term archive of your large data. If you travel this direction, what you get is dollar per byte uh, decrease, the price drops. If you travel this direction, uh, you get uh, faster and faster access speed. But you lose in terms of cost, you lose in terms of whether your data is permanent or what a, what a time when you lose power in the system. Okay. Once you have a hierarchy like this, memory hierarchy like this, uh, then you create this, artificially you create this problem of data transfer. Because CPU only operates, uh, data resides on cache. But a lot of your data is on disk, and you have this hierarchical structure among them. So you, <coughs> you have to deal with this data transfer problem, which is from disk to main memory, the memory to cache. That's for reading a data. For updating a data item, you need to uh, then perform the write initially at cache, push it back to the memory, trigger back down to disk eventually. And all of these are costly, as you can imagine, because you are transferring data from one storage media to another. Uh, this obviously involves cost. For the purpose of this class, we primarily focus on data transfer between uh, disk and main memory. And later on, at, towards the end of the class of this semester, if we have time, we will talk about the transfer between memory and cache, which becomes increasingly important in today's architect, when you talk about main memory data, when all your data is stored in main memory, and you're using a multi-core architecture, you have multiple threads going on at the same time, then cache utilization becomes really crucial in those systems. But here we focus on the traditional, uh, the still dominant type of relational database out there, which is uh, uh, still based on disk. So data transfer is the first cost. The, ma the major cost in those systems is to minimize the data transfer between disk and memory, rather than memory and cache. Okay, so we, we focus on that. So there are a bunch of issues involving uh, data transfer between memory and cache. Uh, basically, it boils down to a simple principle that you can, you can easily say even without going to the details. Right? You want to minimize the amount of transfer between disk and memory, period. Right? Because moving data between two different storage media is costly, I think. So you want to minimize that. So the question is, the central, the central challenge is, how can you minimize such transfers? How can you minimize such transfers? In order to do that, we first need to understand the structure of a disk, and how data is organized in the memory, and then how, they are, uh, how data is transferred between the two. So essentially, there are two components in the database that touch on this topic. One is the space manager, the other is buffer manager that manages your memory space, this man manages your disk space. And these two modules will interact with each other uh, to take care of data transfer between the two. Make sense? Okay, so first, let's look at uh, disk. <coughs> There's a concept associated with disk which is file. In a database, every single table of your database will be stored as a database file on disk. It will be translated to a file on disk. So <coughs> the disk has to support two basic operations over this data. One is read, one is write. So when you type a select from where clause, that translates to essentially a number of reads from the corresponding file. If you do an insertion or alter or update, that essentially translates to a number of bytes uh, to disk. Right? So we need to support read and write. The first question you may argue, why not store everything on memory? Uh, the reason for that is, the question is here. Uh, one of the reasons is, is cost too much. Right? Memory is, is expensive. Right? The dollar per byte is still much higher than a dollar per byte compared to disk. Right? So you don't want to pay uh, too much on storing data uh, 
uh, in memory, if you did it, especially if you did it huge. Secondly, you have you do have limitation on how many uh, how how big a, a memory you can have on a single computer. It's not like can go up forever, even if you don't care about the amount of dollar you spend. They're, they do have limitation on how many uh, how big the memory can be when you uh, talk about a single computer. You may argue, what about if I use a cluster of computers and I use the memory space collectively from those computers? That's my disk one, memory one, memory two, disk two, and so on and so forth. You can imagine that I build a layer on top that looks like this, and when you access this location, I translate to some location on memory one. When you access this location, I translate to some memory location on memory two. And this can easily, this simple concept can be expanded to many, many nodes you have. Huh? So what's the problem with this approach? Well, first of all, to realize this is not that simple, right? Uh, to make it efficient and safe. Safe and efficient. It's not easy. Secondly, when you go to a large number of nodes, this no longer is a RAM in the traditional sense of RAM. Because as we have argued just now, the formal definition of RAM is to have constant access time no matter where you are reading data from or writing data to. Right? That's what we said. But if you go with this architect, eventually you will break down uh, in the sense that when you access a remote location, it will be much more, much more costly than accessing a local location. Because why? Because there is network data in the system. Okay? And there are systems like this such as RAM clock. So one of the family members, New Harry, the department, Ryan Stutzman, he works on this part. So the solution over there, they argue you can use fiber network. Instead of the typical uh, gigabits per second network you find in a typical cluster, but fiber is extremely expensive. And a typical cluster do not have fiber network. So you still observe this latency uh, produced by this network uh, access uh, to a remote location. But nevertheless, it's definitely a viable solution uh, to, uh, to the problem we are discussing here. But let's assume <coughs> that we do not have enough memory space for the amount of data you want. Because eventually, yes, you can expand your memory, but I can be the <coughs> adversary here. I can play the evil here. I can keep increasing my data as well. I'm increasing my data is cheap. I can simply copy my data 10 times. Increasing memory costs dollars, right? So in the end, I win this game for sure. So we do have to worry about something other than memory uh, still, right? We still have to have a storage media in place when you run out of memory. So that's come with this. You can read, up, read this, but let me go directly to <coughs> this picture here. So this is the typical structure of a disk that go into any computer you are using right now. Of course, if you have a Mac with uh, only SSD, then you do not have this. Uh, I have a Linux Windows uh, 2 operating system on this. This is only has SSD as well. There are no hard drive here. Okay. But if you do have a desktop, Chances are you will have this that looks like this. Okay, so if you look at this structure, there are a few uh, distinct components that you can immediately recognize. There is a spindle in the, in the middle. There's an arm assembly at the side. Then there are many what we call platters that attach to the spindle in the middle. And the spindle rotate all the time. So once you power up your system, they rotate all the time. Of course, there are some systems where they try to do smart management over the disk. They shut down the disk at a certain point and bring them on uh, when there's access to that disk. But that only makes sense if you have a large number of disks to manage and you have a duplication among your data. 
For now, let's assume that we are talking about single disk. In that case, the disk is on all the time and it's rotating. Once it's on, it will rotate in one direction, clockwise or anti-clockwise. So it rotates in one direction all the time. When the spindle rotates, it takes the, all the platters along with it. So all the platters will rotate all the time as well. And you have multiple platters attached to a spindle. And each platter has two surfaces, top and bottom. <coughs> and each surface is nothing else but a magnetic field that can represent 0 and 1. Okay. And each platter is organized into what we call track. So this is one track. And within a track, you have sector. And each sector is a consecutive collection of bytes from that track. And typically, a, a sector is of size 512 bytes. So it's about 4,000 bits. It's about 4,000 bits for one sector. <coughs> and all the sectors that have the same radius to the same distance to the spindle form a logical concept called the track. So all of these guys together they form a track. And all the tracks that are same distance away from the spindle across all the platters, they form another abstraction called the cylinder. Of the cylinder. Make sense? Any questions so far? Okay, and then this iron assembly, this guy does not rotate, rather it moves in and out. So it can go this direction, in and out. <coughs> and there's a head of the arm, and this particular area is able to transfer data from a magnetic field into electrons. In other words, it can translate 0 and 1 in magnetic sense to they are one in uh, electrical sense. And that's able to convert data from disk to memory already, if you think, if you think about it. Make sense? All right, so with that being said, how do we <coughs> read and write data from disk? Well, there's one more concept uh, that people introduce when you, uh, when you come to manage uh, data on disk, which is the concept of page or block. <coughs> a page or a block is nothing else but a collection of consecutive sectors. A collection of consecutive sectors. And they are typically in the size of kilobytes. Say 4K or 8 kilobytes or even 16 and from a database system point of view, the minimum unit to read from and write to disk is a page. So even if you're just interested in one byte or even one bit, you will have to read in a whole block or page containing that byte or bit from disk. You never read just a single bit or byte from disk. That never happens. But if you talk about a block device, that is the, <coughs> the dryer inside the operating system that inter the lowest driver inside the operating system that interact with your disk. Do you follow me? That may be able to create us, you know, at a finer granularity with a sector. But the smallest you can go is the sector. You cannot Beat that. You have to read at least, for example, if the sector size is 512 bytes, that's the minimum you have you can go. If you read data from and to disk, right? You have to read 512 bytes at the time. But if you're talking about database system, it's even bigger than that. It is organized in this form called page or block, they are the same thing, which is 4K or 8K or 16K. So if your sector is 512 bytes, a 4 kilobytes page will be 8 sectors. Eight sectors. So this is uh, showing the movement of different components on the disk. You can look at this. 
well, I go over the, uh, the concept next, right? How do you read data from disk and write data to the disk, okay? So the way you read data from disk is very simple. There is a disk space manager, which we talked about just now, that translates a page ID, a block ID, to a location on this, address on this. Okay? And this address, this signal, this information is sent to the block device driver that control the disk, which in turn controls the, the disk, the ARM assembly. Remember, the ARM assembly moves in and out, and the platter rotates with the spindle all the time. These two combinations already allow you to go to any location on disk. You think about it. Okay? If I want to read data, on a particular track, what I will do is I have to move the arm assembly so that the head of the arm is aligned to that particular track. But you are not done yet because the page you try to read from that track may not be right below the head yet of your arm. So what you have to do is wait for the disk to rotate until the starting address of that page is right below the head of your arm. Then you can start transferring data, which is essentially convert the zero and ones from the magnetic field to uh, uh, electrical zero and ones, so that your memory can understand. You do this translation while <laughs> the disk is keep rotating. But that's okay because you're reading a page of data typically, or even more pages typically. So while you are, you are converting the data, sectors after sector after sector is being rotated under the head of your arm, you just convert them one by one until you're done. Make sense? So that's how you read data from this. And writing data to this is the same thing, it's the same purpose. Exactly the same process. That clear? Now, that being said, let's look at the difference between random access and sequential access on this. page on the same track, but eventually you will run out of that. Then you go next cylinder or next track on the same cylinder. That's, that's a question. That, so let me ask somebody to answer that. So you go uh, to the next track of this field. Why? So, uh, so that you're, uh, you're saving on arm movement. Very good. You go to the next track or next platter in the same cylinder because that way your arm stay put. 
you do not need to move your arm. But eventually you will run out of that as well. So it goes like this, go down, like this, go down. Actually, you don't go that much down, right? Because you have two surfaces to the same platter. So you go like this, go like this, then go down to the next platter. But when you run out of all the platters, all the tracks from the same cylinder, what do you do? What's next now? Now next is the next uh, next cylinder, the first track of the next cylinder. And at that point, you do need to move your arm, either in or out, depending on you go inside or outside. Okay? So you see the major difference between random and sequential access. Do you follow me? So random access is <laughs> sporadic over all these locations, anywhere. Sequential access is nice in the sense that I, for the first page, I need to move my arm, I need to do the rotation, but after that is routing access. I stay put, I wait, wait for the, these to rotate, that's it. I don't do anything. Occasionally, I need to move my arm, but only it happen once so often. So the amortized cost is much lower compared to random access. In contrast, if you do random access, what happens? You move your arm, wait for the rotation, finish reading your page, and move your arm again. Wait for the rotation, finish reading. Move your arm again. Wait for the rotation, wait, finish. Do that again. Because why? Because your address to access are all over the place. Okay? It's kind of like you want to meet with your friends to do your product. And you have 10 friends. One is in MEB, one is in WEB, one is in the football stadium to get ready for the game. All right? One is at home, didn't get the ticket, which is not on YouTube. And you call them, you say, why don't we meet? Sequential access says, your friends are nice. They say, okay, let's all come to MEB or WEB. And this particular room, you come in, you read all of us, you're done. Random access, your friends are nasty, saying that, you know, come, one by one, I don't care. You have to come here first, then there, and so on and so forth. Obviously, the cost is much higher. Okay? So, that's essentially the difference of the two. <laughs> and there are detailed discussion here, I will skip. Give you some uh, numbers. Oh, to formalize the discussion we just had. So if you think about the cost associated with reading a page from, from, from disk, what do you have? You have six time, which is the time to move your arm to the right track. That's what we call the sync time. You also have rotation delay, which is once your arm, the head of your arm is aligned with the right track, you have to wait for the start of your page to be rotated right under the head of your arm. That is what we call the rotation delay. And typically, you do not know what the rotation delay will be because it's a circle, right? And it depending on the, the precise time you have moved your arm head to align with that track, it could be that the data you were you are trying to read just passed the head of the arm. Or it could be that you are really lucky, they're just about to go under the head of your arm. So the average case, we look at the average case. The average case is the time for one rotation. Time for one rotation, and you take half of that. Because that's the average case. So that's the rotation delay. And then there's another small component called transfer time, which is the time <coughs> that it takes you to convert data from the magnetic field into electron signals. But that time is, is tiny compared to the sig time and rotation delay. Why? Because sig time and rotation delay are mechanical in nature. A mechanical movement, of course, is going to be much more expensive than a magnetic, dealing with magnetic field and electrons. Electrons travel at the, almost at the speed of light. 
I don't know any mechanical structure that can travel in the speed of light. If you do, uh, that space travel becomes uh, possible. Right? Uh, give you, I finished this when we were done. This is a typical, uh, if you look at uh, any disk you're going to purchase, there are some parameters like capacity and so on and so forth. They will, they will tell you the six time for the disk. Now you know what a six time means. They will also tell you something called RPM. Uh, what is that? That's rotation per minute. How many rotations a disk can do in one minute? That number alone tells you the rotation delay for the disk. Why? Because you can use the 60 minutes divided by that. That gives you how many rotations you can do per second. Uh, the inverse of that tells you how many seconds one rotation takes. You take half of that, that gives you the rotation delay. So in other words, the higher this number is, RPM is, the better your disk is, because that means small rotation delay. The smaller the sig time is, the better it is. That means you can move your, your arm quickly. With that, we stop right here. Uh, do remember to start working on your homework too. Okay?